Welcome back. Our next session is Institutionalization of Digital Assets. It's going to be a panel moderated by Manasi Vora, the VP of Strategy and Operations at Skynet Labs. She's also the founder of Women in Blockchain Boston and the director of MIT Bitcoin Expo in 2019. Our panelists are Robert Margolis, director on the Global Digital Markets Desk at BlockFi, and William Fenn, investor and director at Pantera Capital. Welcome, welcome, Nancy, Rob, and William. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction and for having us. It's always great to come back to MIT Bitcoin Expo, and the conference has been amazing so far. Um, so yeah, today we are going to be talking about institutionalization of digital assets and DeFi. As the title suggests, um, it's going to be all things institutions. And just in the last year, we've seen companies like Tesla and PayPal accept Bitcoin payments, organizations like MicroStrategy, insurance giants like Mass Mutual buying Bitcoin on their books, payment networks like Visa announcing plans to settle in USDC, and traditional financial giants like JP Morgan doing a 180 degree turn calling, you know, from calling Bitcoin a fraud to putting a price target of $130,000 now. We've seen a lot. Uh, so today we'll be talking about some of these trends. Uh, what are still some of the challenges that face institutions in terms of adoption and then the potential future for digital assets and DeFi. Today we have uh, joining us Rob Margulis from BlockFi and William Fan from Pandora Capital. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, let's get Thanks started with a quick um, introduction and background. Um, Rob, if you want to kick us off. Yeah, happy to. Thanks for having us here, guys. I appreciate it. Um, my background, so started in traditional finance, uh, was doing equity derivative structuring and sales at Goldman for a bit, and then jumped over into fixed, um, fixed income trading, uh, was managing short duration mini bond portfolios for the firm's private clients. So I did that for about a year before realizing that you know, traditional finance just wasn't really my passion and uh, sort of by happenstance, I didn't have sort of classic fall down the crypto rabbit hole story. I sort of happenstance fall into it when a uh, former trader who I used to work with reached out because she was uh, starting a the first CFTC regulated exchange for physically settled options on Bitcoin, a company called Ledger X. Um, they needed somebody to join to head up institutional sales, so decided to jump in. Um, and I was fortunate enough that it ended up bringing me to BlockFi, where I now head up our crypto native practice on the institutional side of our business. So covering all of the firm's clients who are solely focused on digital assets like hedge funds, prop trading firms, corporates, um, but also that includes foundations as well, working with uh, interesting protocols um, and then miners and, and other sort of hard asset businesses that focus on digital assets too. Yeah, I think we have similar backgrounds in the sense that I'm an engineer turned banker now dabbling into the crypto space. So really excited for today's conversation. William, if you want to go next. Thank you. Likewise, I'm also an engineer turned dabbler in the crypto space. Uh, I have a dual background in uh, business and EE. And I started in private equity, moved on to tech and in tech startups. I worked at a cloud infrastructure startup for a while. Founded one of the earlier uh, hedge funds slash venture funds in this space, Zero One Capital, and eventually joined Pantera Capital, where today I'm a head of all the quantitative strategies and a member of the investment committee. Happy to be here. Awesome. So let's start with the fundamental question of why is it important for the crypto space that institutions adopt digital assets? Um, there are two divergent thoughts, as you know. One is the ethos of cryptocurrency, which is to disrupt these intermediaries and disrupt the traditional finance. And on the other hand, we're super excited and building infrastructure for these institutions to come in. Um, what are the implications of institutions finally now that we are seeing them come in? I guess I can start with this one. So I think there are both pragmatic and philosophical reasons for that institutions would seek to adopt crypto. The practical reason is that in the practice of investment, we're always looking at correlations between asset classes because institutions require large portfolios across diverse asset classes. And it just so happens that crypto as a brand new asset class has unique correlations to some traditional assets. It is largely uncorrelated at intervals of time and to others, it has 
inverse correlations into others as positive, but this profile of which is not quite the same as any other asset class that investors can currently invest in before the advent of digital assets. And so for the interest of diversification and performance, um, it is within the mandate of investment managers now to look at crypto, which is now over a trillion dollars in asset class in, in market cap. The philosophical reason is, as Ray Dalio from Bridgewater, for example, once put it, uh, Bitcoin is almost like a <clears throat> call option on the future um, as both as both a store of value thesis as well as a decentralized economic instrument. Um, one could say that you know we should invest in it for utility as well as for the interest of fostering the sort of permissionless innovation that blockchain has been has been enabling for entrepreneurs and developers the past several years. And we've seen a lot of development there in DeFi as well as in other applications currently burgeoning and growing. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, you're going to continue to see as we live in this sort of new age of just unlimited monetary stimulus. If you're a asset manager or a portfolio manager at a big institution, you're going to have to seek alternative ways to earn risk premium, right? And so, you know, historically there have been, you know, various alternative investment products that don't have the same, um, you know, innovative structures like Bitcoin does. And I think, you know, people are going to continue to find Bitcoin as a investable asset class as infrastructure grows around it and as the rails for big traditional institutions that they're used to become more available for them to, to buy and hold this asset class. And you know, that could be whether it's, um, you know, companies providing credit into the space for them to do it. It could be companies providing, um, you know, more seamless custody or trading platforms. But you know, even I think more importantly is also just the development of derivative markets for them to get exposure to it. I think that's going to be a big theme for the rest of this year and into 2022 is, um, you know, how are people going to find alternative ways to get exposure to this class, asset class that fits within their investment profiles. Yeah, and just these institutions coming in also brings in a lot of investment and hopefully that investment gets directed towards the underlying infrastructure, you know, keeping the network secure, funding Bitcoin core developers, um, so yeah, it's it's super exciting to see the last 12 years um, journey has been more from, you know, retail adoption to now finally this, um, you know, wave of institutions that we've seen over the last year. Uh, what according to you, you know, how has that sentiment towards cryptocurrency changed um, since, you know, 2009? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just, uh, you know, it certainly was a retail driven market for a, for a very long time. Um, even, you know, up until, you know, 2017, 2018, it was, I would consider it largely a retail driven market, mostly just because institutions didn't have, you know, again, the infrastructure to really invest in it. You know, I still think the idea of it solely becoming an institutional marketplace is, is false. I think there's always going to be a space for retail investors to be holding digital assets through different vehicles. And it's also going to be more and more important, right? You know, going back to the point of, you know, never ending monetary stimulus, people's retirement savings are going to continue to get devalued over time, right? And so an important thing for, for people to think about is, you know, how do I protect myself for the future? You know, how do I be a, a sort of prudent saver? Owning Bitcoin is going to be a large part of that, in my opinion. Um, so I continue to see it being both a retail and institutional driven marketplace, but it's certainly been really incredible to see over the past year, year and a half, the rails being built for institutions to come in and, and be major market drivers in this space. Yeah, I think one thing I would add to that is that in the past, uh, over the past 10 years, and also more broadly over the past one year, I think we've begun to live in a, an environment of more geopolitical uncertainty and greater macroeconomic inflation. Uh, in the past year alone, because of COVID and the stimulus packages, trillions of dollars were injected into the economy, and we can, we can see it on, for example, the M2 money flows which is essentially a way to track the circulating buying power, not just cash, but also de credit and debit in the economy. And this has increased astronomically, uh, though it was already you know, always trending up. And so in this era, and given the conditions, I think both retail and institutional investors are looking toward assets 
wants to nominate in, in options such as gold and silver and precious metals and com other commodities, but now in digital assets, which also have provable scarcity to essentially provide stores of value for the long term, as well as provide speculatory return in the short term. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, according to you, um, the pandemic definitely has played a role in the rise of institutional adoption and then the economic cycle that we are in, you know, some may call our current economy overheated and institutions looking for either alpha or just hedging um, the current economic cycle that we are in. Uh, Rob, any additional thoughts you would want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think uh, whether you're looking at it from a corporate treasury standpoint of view where they're trying to find alternatives than just keeping massive cash balances, you know, I, I think Bitcoin fits a really nice role there, right? You know, that was pioneered by guys like Michael Saylor, who, you know, came out and, and put a large percentage of their balance sheets, their corporate balance sheets into crypto. And it turned out to be an incredible investment, you know, long-term investment. And there's certainly going to be some volatility around that. It's not always going to continue to go up for those of us who've been in this market for long enough, but, you know, it, it fits a really nice use case there. And then I think, you know, if you're looking more on sort of the investment side and the alpha side, I think um, it's, you know, Bitcoin certainly fits that strategy as, again, like an alternative risk premium. And I think what we're going to see more and more of is these larger sort of call it more traditional institutional investors, because there's certainly institutional investors who are, who are, you know, trading in more of the liquid venture capital type space, as I like to think of it. You're going to see more of these big traditional institutions get invested in that side of the business as well, not just owning Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, so let's talk about some examples. Um, probably, William, if you can start from Pantera's uh, perspective, what are you seeing? You know, what are the questions that you're dealing with when you it comes to institutional investors? What are they demanding? What are the use cases that they're most interested about? So in our firm, we separate it into four major categories. The first would be cryptocurrency and tokens. Um, these would be sort of payment related applications. And the second would be base layer platform blockchains. So this would be Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, two quintessential examples, the former being the essentially the prototype of all blockchains and used mostly in a transactional or ledger capacity. The second, Ethereum being the prototype of all smart contract platforms, this would be the essentially blockchain 2.0 sort of perspective that enables these applications and smart contracts they built on top. And then the last would be then the applications and smart contracts themselves, some of which are not exactly a contract individually, but maybe a collection of contracts or a essentially a fully a fully stacked code that, code stack that allows you to implement some sort of service or application. So currently, the market as a whole is obviously weighted very heavily towards Bitcoin and Ethereum. I mean, together they they occupy over eighty percent of the market caps. But at Pantera, we take a more holistic approach where we're looking across all four of these categories. In particular, the last category, applications, uh, which includes all, all DeFi applications developed today, uh, is something that we're taking an interest in because this is the segment of blockchain that is developing the most traction currently, gaining the most users, um, as well as actually pioneering true utility and applications. Yeah, and Rob, uh, from a service provider perspective, um, you mentioned treasury management as one of the applications. What are some uh, other use cases that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, from BlockFi's perspective, you know, we're generally we we generally fit within the crypto ecosystem as a provider of credit, both on the consumer side and the institutional side, right? So on BlockFi's consumer side, um, you can take out a loan against your crypto holdings, which was an innovative product when it first launched back in 2017. On the institutional side, it's more about facilitating flows across the crypto ecosystem by providing capital. So you know, it's interesting when you compare it against a traditional marketplace where there is no real central clearing party, right? So if you're a crypto hedge fund, for example, and you're trading on Binance and Huobi and Coinbase and Kraken and, you know, all these different platforms, there's no, you know, central prime broker, really, at least not yet, that you can go to and post capital and they have accounts at all the different exchanges that you can trade on. There are some that, you know, offer that more smart order router type execution services, but it's not quite the same if you want to implement your own trading strategies directly on these platforms. 
What BlockFi can do is we can step in there and provide the capital for you to trade on these different exchanges. Um, and that, you know, that capital efficiency is huge across crypto because the market's still so fragmented. So I think that's going to continue to develop. I think there's going to be a lot of new, exciting innovations around this concept of, of you know, walled gardens almost. Um, there are a lot of platforms that are looking to build it out right now. Um, so I'd say that's going to be a big development, something that we're seeing a lot on the infrastructure side of crypto. That's going to be a big theme for 2022. Yeah, and I'm just tagging on to that, how, how does um, credit risk assessment work in a decentralized ecosystem? We take a really centralized approach. So it's going to be a little bit different. I'm sure, you know, William, you'll probably be able to speak more intelligent than I can about the DeFi ecosystem and, and underwriting credit risk. But at least at BlockFi, it's, it, it's not all too different from a bank, to be completely honest. It functions a lot. You know, we have a team of... Um, we have a team of credit underwriters who work at BlockFi. We hired like four of them from Bank of America who worked in the hedge fund credit risk team there. And it's their job to underwrite each one of our institutional loans by you know, doing deep dive processes on each one of our institutional counterparties. So each counterparty has a direct credit officer who covers them. They learn about their business, their risk reporting, they you know, understand their financial position, and then they make a credit assessment based on that, much like the way it works at a bank. Right. The, the thing that I would add on to that is that it's the underlying mechanisms of enforcing risk is not so different than in traditional finance, where a bank might look at something like, for example, the value at risk um, of a given position or, or likely try to compute you know, how much credit to offer a client. These things are largely the same in many of the DeFi applications, but they are enforced in a decentralized fashion, by which I mean they're essentially codified into a programmatic smart contract that then enforces these restrictions and computations and determinations in a decentralized fashion, uh, whereby, by which I mean the smart contract itself is executed on the blockchain, which, you know, as we all know, is a de decentralized ledger. So rather than a central entity, a central bank, some guy sitting at a credit risk desk in a, a given central bank, you know, your individual credit limit and risk are given and enforced by essentially the all of the participants that are currently mining on the blockchain, to put it simply. But the underlying yeah. determinations and computations are the same. Yeah, and you also, you know, mentioned um, Pantera Capital has, you know, Bitcoin Fund, Ethereum Fund, maybe, um, and other asset managers also provide similar token funds for institutions. And then one question that usually comes up is, you know, what prevents institutions from buying crypto directly instead of having to go through some of these funds? And I believe um, bringing crypto strategy in-house is just expensive. There's a lot of talent gap. There's a lot of operational expertise needed. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the Bitcoin fund is, is essentially an index vehicle. So we have very low fees. And it didn't. It doesn't require so much specialized talent in the practice of investment in crypto. Um, in terms of comparisons to you know, competing options, we we offer greater liquidity, daily liquidity, for example, in this case for the Bitcoin fund. And the Bitcoin fund actually outperforms Bitcoin because Bitcoin has in its history forked several times, most notably Bitcoin Cash. And so we provided a white glove service whereby these forks are then harvested uh, in terms of value for our investors in this fund. So even though it largely tracks Bitcoin, uh, we provide additional white glove services on top, for example, custody and you know, management around these, these issues on the forks. So I think that that, that in turn answers a, a need among institutional investors, which is you could today go and just buy Bitcoin on an exchange, even you know, as a high net worth individual or family office. But you know, there's there are still many practices around the custody of those assets, um, the management of those assets, even if you only intend to hold for the long term, that you know don't really fit the operational profile of investors, in particular larger and institutional investors. So firms like Pantera then step in to fill that gap with you know, index vehicles like the Bitcoin fund. Yeah, and I think in terms of infrastructure, we've come, come a long way, like you mentioned, custody, providing custody solutions, um, or even just the market liquidity has grown. You know, we're now at $2 trillion. Um, and there's a lot of market depth 
that institutions are looking for. Um, you know, what, what what do we need for the next wave of institutions to come in? What, what are we still missing? I'm sure there is a lot of you know things on our checklist that we need to get through to have uh, even greater adoption. Yeah, I think one thing I would add, and and even to the point of your earlier question, something that is holding a lot of institutions back that we see on our end is is even more something as simple as like their fund docs don't allow them to own physical Bitcoin. So they actually can't go out to Coinbase if they want to just pick like the simplest way, like go to Coinbase or go to BlockFi or, you know, go to wherever and just buy or go to an OTC desk and just buy, you know, a hundred million dollars in Bitcoin. They actually just can't do that because it's not written into their fund docs. So they're trying to find alternative ways to get exposure to Bitcoin without actually owning the underlying physical. And so I'd say the most common way we see that is through CME futures just because it gives them a cash settled option that gets them exposure to crypto. Uh, we see that through investments in um, funds, you know, they'll go out and they'll invest in funds like, you know, Pantera has an excellent option. It could be investing in public market equities or things like GBTC as an example. Um, but I, what I think I would say, and I've touched on it a few times, but I, I really believe, I think the biggest, um, the biggest development that we're going to see in crypto on the institutional side is going to be the growth of the derivative marketplace right now. It's still in its nascent stage. You know, CME futures have grown a lot over the past few years, but they're still not, you know, incredibly liquid where it can handle very large institutional flow. There's incredible overseas exchanges that do, you know, really interesting offerings, but they're just not as regulated where large traditional investors feel comfortable trading on them. So once we see, you know, the development of like a real options marketplace, you know, a, a sorry, I should say more liquid regulated options marketplace in the US, that's going to be a massive boon for institutional investors trying to get exposure through traditional mechanisms that they're used to. Yeah, I mean, uh, we heard from Hester Peirce yesterday, um, the SEC commissioner, um, you know, they are in an interesting spot where they do want to give more clarity in terms of regulation, but they also don't want to overburden and come in too soon as they're still trying to understand how cryptocurrencies and this entire ecosystem works. Um, in terms of, you know, conversations that you are having probably uh, at Pandera and also at BlockFi, what are some of the biggest like regulatory hurdles you're seeing um, when it comes to institutions adopting this technology? You want to take this one or should I take this one, William? <laughs> um, in terms of the biggest regulatory hurdles, I think from our perspective, exclusively from our perspective, I would say that the biggest hurdle would be in capital formation. So in terms of the, the creation and formation of new funds and what instruments those funds can invest in, what investors they can service, what forms of KYC and AML that we need to do on prospective LPs. Um, Pantera currently manages seven different investment vehicles, three venture funds, four hedge funds. And part of the reason, at least, that we have this many you know, different vehicles is because of the fact that you know, we've had to be careful in the formation of all these different vehicles and each of their different fund mandates and each of their different target clientele and each of their different investment strategies. Um, the fine granularity between all of these is codified in their subscription documents and in their formation documents. And we've had to be careful about this because we want to be you know, respectful of, of regulatory clarity in this space. In the beginning, um, there may have been you know, very little of that. So even as, as that develops today, I think firms like Pantera, especially at you know, a medium or larger size, do want to be you know, respectful of ongoing you know, regulatory clarity and also in, in terms of their capital formation to create you know, vehicles that are specific in their purpose and in their, in their audience. Yeah. Um, are there examples of, you know, I'm, at the beginning of this panel, I mentioned Square, PayPal, Visa, all the big names now coming in in different ways, some from like investment perspective, some from, you know, accepting Bitcoin as a payment perspective, um, some also just like providing services to other institutions, other examples or uh, use cases that you're most excited about going in the future. Uh, I'm continuing to be really excited about the developments within the DeFi infrastructure. 
and how that's going to play out, how traditional institutions are going to start getting more comfortable with things, with concerns around AML and KYC requirements of these different platforms and how they're going to go about solving some of those concerns. Because there's been a lot of development over the past few months with that. But I think it's, it's sort of, it's gotten past the point where you could make the argument against DeFi as like a, a, a you know, where the future of finance is going, right? You know, for a while, I think people can make the argument that it's small, but it's over what, like $40 billion in total value lock at this point. It's become such a massive part of the ecosystem that eventually more traditional institutions are going to start wanting to interact with it. But how do they solve some of those base concerns around AML and KYC is going to be a huge market shift that I'm, you know, constantly monitoring because I'm curious to hear how somebody's going to solve it. And what are, uh, you know, uh, from a BlockFi perspective, where is the, our biggest growth coming from? So I would say it's, uh, it's twofold. One, so we're going to be launching on the consumer side of our business. We're going to be launching the crypto rewards credit card, which is going to be the first of its kind where you can actually spend it just like a credit card in your wallet. But instead of earning, you know, miles or, or points that you're not really using these days, you can actually earn crypto which is going to be a fantastic tool for people. And we're really excited about that because no one wants to spend their crypto like a debit card offered, right? You want to spend it like a regular credit card, but just get the benefit of earning compounding rewards in crypto that go to your BlockFi account. You're going to start earning interest on it. Um, on the institutional side of our business, I would say just continuing to roll out a larger trading platform. So right now, because we've already established ourselves as one of the largest providers of credit in the digital asset space on the institutional side, we can leverage those rails to be a very attractive trading partner with offering margin financing against that because dollar financing is really our bread and butter. Yeah, and what, you know, mostly when we talk about lending, uh, at least in the retail market, it's mostly for speculation use cases. Um, what are institutions borrowing and lending for? Say the number, uh, so I'd say the two largest ones that we see right now, one is just working capital. Um, so like an example would be, you know, you're a miner and you need to buy equipment and denominated in US dollars and you earn your returns in Bitcoin. So being able to borrow dollars to purchase equipment is a really common use case. Um, and I'd say the second most common use case right now is just for futures basis trading. So coming to a firm like BlockFi and being able to, again, borrow USD or USDC, uh, take that, go long spot Bitcoin and short the future allows you to capture that basis spread. And, you know, his, I mean, over the past couple months, that's traded anywhere from 15% to 30% annualized, um, depending on the venue you're trading it at. So that becomes a really attractive trade for people and a need again for somebody to borrow to, to really leverage those returns. Yeah, and before um, there, are, I see there are a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Before I go there, uh, William, you know, as one of the first asset managers in the space, what is Pandora Capital's take on the future of digital assets and DeFi when it comes to institutions? So it's no coincidence that DeFi is, was one of the first provable applications of, of blockchain technology in terms of practical application. And given the fact that you know, Bitcoin first started its life as a, essentially a payment instrument, um, as well as the fact that traditionally finance has been a very difficult industry to disrupt for the fact that, you know, there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of um, entry friction, which is why, you know, traditional finance has been managed by the same firms for over a hundred years. And unlike in other verticals, you know, software has not been able to eat this particular sector as of yet, but DeFi came about because of, as I mentioned in the beginning of this panel, the permissionless innovation that blockchain enables, which is to say that you know, a group mind can just work on an open source project. And essentially that project would then be adopted by users completely frictionless of you know, larger institutions, incumbent institutions. And as of today, I think as Rob mentioned, there's actually almost 50 billion in total value locked in DeFi platforms. So this entire growth has been very wholesome so far. Um, it's touched on the disruption of many different financial primitives, um, borrowing, lending, clearing, settlement, trading, all of these. And their development has in turn also catalyzed further institutional entry into this space as well as the broader blockchain space. So all this development is something that Pantera's, we have Pantera has been very excited to see. Um, to 
in some ways a vindication of our earlier thesis betting on applications and, and you know, smart contracts on top of being built on top of these platforms. And we're, we're very curious to see where this all leads. Awesome. Um, so there's a question about BTC's store of value narrative. Um, my understanding is most institutions do not hold a store of value proposition or position. Um, do you see most institutions skipping traditional store of value example gold and ra going right into BTC? Or do you see them going to gold first and then transitioning to BTC? I think one of the interesting things about gold, property about gold that you know, maybe until Bitcoin was developed was just an accepted narrative, but now it's something that I think any institutional investor has to be thoughtful about is, you know, let's just say that the price of gold increases a hundred X or a thousand X or whatever. You got to imagine that there's going to be a massive influx of capital to find ways to mine more gold out of the earth. Right. And eventually, you know, continue to devalue the, the, the unit measurement of gold. Right. And that's not possible in Bitcoin. Uh, that's never going to happen, right? Programmatically, it is not possible. So I think people over time are going to continue to see Bitcoin as a better store of value investment than things like gold or silver or, or you know, whatever mineral you're getting from the earth. Yeah, I also love what um, Michael from MicroStrategy said that gold has a shelf life of 30 years and Bitcoin has a shelf life of infinity. <laughs> um, there's another question, how much uh, leverage can you take in crypto and how does leveraging a trading strategy differ from traditional markets? Maybe Rob or William? Yeah, I think uh, it sort of depends, I guess, depending on you know what you're looking to do. You can, you, know, you can take 100x leverage on BitMEX you know, back in the day. So you can take a lot of leverage if you want to take it, depending on the venues you're looking to trade on. I think most institutional investors and, and I always want to try to be clear about this. There's two different ways, not two different ways. There's a lot of ways you can look at an institutional investor because there's certainly crypto native firms that are institutional investors. And then there's also more traditional institutional investors. And that also has a wide range of types of institutions, right? Where hedge funds can run, you know, 5X levered and it could be a family office that goes even higher or it could be a uh, large asset manager that doesn't run any leverage. So it really does vary. Um, based on the investment profile and, you know, their, their tools that they have access to. I don't know if you can answer this next question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, can you address some of the chatter about BlockFi's involvement in GBTC premium art trade? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it was, it was uh, pretty entertaining watching a lot of that come up. I think, you know, the short of it is this, right? Like the numbers definitely look large, but BlockFi has 17 billion in assets on our platform. That position was very much sized appropriately for the size of our business. Um, in terms of you know ongoing risk, it's definitely something that we're continuing to monitor, but its actual impact on BlockFi's broader business is actually fairly small. The other thing to think about too is that while some you know traditional players who are investing in these products have a investment horizon on that, BlockFi doesn't we can continue to sit on that product and we do believe that it's a short-term market dislocation and that product will start to trade back towards par um if not you know capture some slight premium above it um and look you know if you think about it from the great grayscale perspective um it's not good for their business right for that product to be trading at a discount right they're not accepting in any new subscriptions so there's no new supply coming to market they're going to do everything in their power as evidenced by um you know going out and purchasing 250 million dollars of the product in the open market by working to partner with Morgan Stanley, I think they announced on Friday to distribute their product to the market. So they're going to do everything in their power to, you know, get that thing traded back towards par. So, you know, in our view, disappointing that some people like to try to, you know, sling mud in the crypto space. I think we're all sort of out here trying to grow, grow this, grow this, uh, grow this space together, right? And that's not the stance that BlockFi takes, but overall, no real risk to our our business. And I think this question comes up every time and it, it's an interesting one, but Bitcoin as a technology, it's, it's a software product at the end of the day. And we see more advanced technology products replace older ones throughout history. Uh, how do you know a technically superior cryptocurrency will not replace Bitcoin as the main cryptocurrency?
I think the answer to this question is that we don't know that it won't. Obviously, you know, markets are efficient, users are practical, and were there to be a superior platform to Bitcoin, it is feasible that that platform will then begin to absorb many of the use cases and therefore the, the users of the Bitcoin platform. But there's a lot of inertia in this space um, by function of the fact that it touches on finance as well, which is a very, by itself, a very high inertia use in sector. So it took thousands of years for Bitcoin to even begin to replace gold. And I think were there to be a superior platform, it would not only have to be superior to Bitcoin enough that it would convince users to, to switch away from all of the primitives and infrastructure that we have now currently built and continue to build to allow users to again, to lend, to borrow, to trade, to settle, to clear, all in denominated in Bitcoin, but also to convince them to adopt that, whatever that platform hypothetically or instrument would be on a philosophical level, you know, that it, that it be a better store of value or that it be a better smart contract platform and so on. So there are more than just technical hurdles, more than just KPIs for any competing platform to clear, for it to be able to actually absorb mind share and users from the incumbent platforms. There's a very high degree of inertia as a function of its design, as well as a function of its the sectors in which it affects. Yeah, and network effects um, as well. So I think that's a good point to end this uh, panel discussion on. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, William, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. Very insightful discussions. Very insightful discussions. It was interesting to have the perspective of institutional capital towards the crypto space. Uh, we're going to do a, a brief pause while we line up for the next session. We're gonna, you're going to be back soon.